Hi, everybody. Welcome to Aliens Among Us Q&A webinar. This is our 11th webinar, and this is the first time we've had an in-person uh, webinar, Aliens Among Us, so it's a pretty special occasion. So we've got, we're actually in Brisbane today, and we're in the Eco Centre at Griffith University, and we've got this special in-person uh, webinar because we've got a special guest here today all the way from Texas. We've got Dr. Robert Puckett. Mm -hmm. Robert's a an extension entomologist from Texas A&M University. He's visiting Australia for the last two weeks. He's going to share his experience of what it's like <laughs> living with fire ants, but also what he's seen in, his, um, in Australia. Mm -hmm. And our panel today uh, to um, join us, we've got uh, a special panel just about fire ants. We've got Rachel Che, Dr. Rachel Che from uh, Queensland, Queensland Biosecurity. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you. And your group oversees the eradication program for the red fire ants in uh, Southeast Queensland. And also uh, beside her, we've got Rhys Pianza, who's our advocacy manager for the Invasive Species Council. And Reese is also based in Brisbane. So thanks for coming along today, Rachel and Reese. Thank you. All right. Well, this is uh, our opportunity to learn all about fire ants in Australia and what's at stake here for uh, uh, Australia with its uh, attempt to keep Australia fire ant free. But I wanted to really take advantage of understanding about fire ants, but also understanding um, the journey that... Uh, that Robert here has been through um, in first learning about fire ants, but also, you know, what brings you, what, how did you get into fire ants and even entomology in your early, early stage uh, of your career? Yeah, so it's a long and winding road. I was not a bug kid. Um, so I was a, a lizard and snake kid. I was sure I wanted to be a herpetologist. And I was in my final semester in my undergraduate degree, and I was taking an upper level ecology course that was taught by an entomologist. So all of her, 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 uh, her field models were insect related. And I was getting a little bit interested. In, and she said, well, my husband has a job, also a professor at that university. I worked for him over the summer. Well, anyway, he, he, uh, he, he was awarded a grant to work on mayflies, of all things. Um, aquatic insects. And he said, hey, listen, I've got this money. He said, I know you want to go to graduate school. And he really said this. Uh, I know you want to be like the next Steve Irwin or something. Um, but he said, you, you know what you call a biologist with a job, right? And she said, what? And he said, that's called an entomologist, right? So um, I worked for him for the summer and I decided it would be a, a, a really good opportunity. So I did that work, but he was an ant guy. And so uh, while I was, I spent two and a half years with him working on my master's degree, but I also worked on all of his ant projects. And I realized that's where I wanted to be. Social insects are amazing animals. Um, and, I, and I felt like there's a career's worth of work there. I wouldn't have guessed that I work on fire ants for the remainder of my career, but I did. So I went and did a, a PhD at Texas A&M University on fire ants and a parasitic fly that was being released at the, in the US at the time as a biocontrol or biosuppression measure for fire ants there. And, uh, and the rest is history. I, I took a job as a research scientist at our university directly after that, and then um, got hired on as a, a faculty member a few years later. And here I am in Australia working on fire ants. And for those who have just joined us, this is the uh, Aliens Among Us Q&A webinar. I'm Andrew Cops, the CEO of the Invasive Species Council. And this is an interactive Q&A. So if you've got any questions for Robert or the panelists, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, not the chat, because we're going to ignore that. It's the Q&A. Put your questions there and we'll ask the best questions of this group here. So please start, start uh, thinking about your question. I met you, Robert, uh, at a fire ant conference in 2016 because I went to the US because I was worried about mm -hmm. fire ants. Uh, and because at that stage, uh, we had an eradication program that had been going on almost 20 years at that mm -hmm. point. Uh, you know, uh, what's it? Uh, I had it been going that long. Uh, maybe 15 years. 15 years. Yeah, 15 years. Yes, 2001, yeah. the fire ants first arrived in Australia. And I could see 
that there was a lot of history and understanding about dealing with fire ants mm. because fire ants have been in the US for a lot longer. Mm -hmm. So tell me, what is it like living in the United States with fire ants? Well, we would prefer not to live with them in the United States. I can certainly share that with you. Um, they are a pervasive pests in all of the southern and southeastern United States. And that's one of the key components that I've been sharing with Australians. Uh, our fire ants have spread to all of the habitat that will support them in the U.S. And this, this occurred a decade or more ago. Um, so, uh, you know, folks are just left to their own devices to manage them. And that's very difficult. We don't have federal or state support. So if you want to manage them on your yard, and people do, uh, just about everybody attempts to manage them in their on their properties. Um, we have to use a lot of insecticides. So insecticidal baits. And unfortunately, um, we, we, well, we, we have a, a, a wide array of insecticides that people will employ against red imported fire ants. These are homeowners, um, most of which have very little training um, in working with these uh, very toxic insecticides. Um, these are contact insecticides they're using in their yards, you know, um, direct contact insecticides and in, in, in liquid formulations and, and uh, dust formulations. But, but we've really settled into using baits, uh, granular baits, insecticidal baits for our fire ants. And, but they're, a, they're, a, they're one of those pests that you have to think about all the time. These occupy or can occupy, you know, essentially every square meter of land in the South. And that goes for yards and schoolyards and athletics fields and, you know, uh, campus grounds at universities. And so we spend a lot of time and a lot of money um, dealing with these guys. Uh, medical costs associated with them, costs for treatment, costs of replacing uh, mechanical and electrical devices that they destroy. They're a real pain in the neck. And they're here to stay. In the U.S., yes. Yeah. They, we, uh, um, you know. Um, in the absence of any sort of new sort of unforeseen technology that that you know we're not thinking about, yeah, these are probably going to be a problem for my grandchildren and their grandchildren. Well, Australia has had eight outbreaks of fire ants so far since two thousand and one. Uh, the other seven after two thousand and one we have successfully eradicated. And the Gladstone eradication, I think, is the world's largest fire ant eradication, maybe the world's mm. largest ant eradication so far, mm. a few mm. thousand hectares. Yeah. So we've got a really good track record of dealing with fire ant outbreaks, except for this really big one that arrived in 2001. We didn't get on top of it, and it's now covering a large area in southeast Queensland. Rachel, I come to you now mm. as being responsible for the nationally coordinated or well, coordinating the national eradication mm. program uh tell me why are fire ants such a big threat to australia sure um just before i commence if if I, you can indulge me chair i might just acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands we're meeting on today um this is this is my hometown so we're currently in mianjin um, which is the lands of the Yugara and Turrbal people. Um, I pay my respects to their elders past and present uh, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who might be joining us online today. So thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to come along. Um, fire ants takes up a large part of my psyche. Um, I'm hoping for it not to become embedded like mm. it, it is in yours, Dr. Puckett. Same but uh, mm. um, so, sorry, just circling back to the question was about um, why it's so important for us to eradicate in Australia. Why are such a threat to Australia. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when we think about biosecurity and when we think about the various pests, you know, the thousands of them um, across the full gamut, generally speaking, they will tick a box. Uh, they may be an environmental pest, they may be an agricultural pest, they may be a plant pest. You know, they, they quite often fit neatly into a box. Um, unfortunately for us, um, red imported fire ants tick all the boxes and have the potential to have very um, hugely negative effects on biodiversity and our environment, um, along with agriculture, social amenity, which is incredibly important to people living in southeast Queensland. It's a beautiful day outside. Um, so the other unfortunate reality for Australia is that unlike, uh, for example, the US, where you have a, uh, a geographic barrier to their um, to their spread, um, you know, uh, modelling has shown us that fire ants could inhabit 95 plus, plus percent of Australia mm. if we were unsuccessful. Mm. Well, they really are a super pest, aren't they? They are indeed, and not super in a good way. Mm. Good. Well, I might come to you now, Reese. Uh, you, I wanted to uh, hear from you uh, your 
journey on uh, and exposure to fire ants. Tell me a bit about what were your first encounter with fire ants. Yeah, so um, this isn't the uh, first time I've been working on this issue with the Invasive Species Council. I actually uh, worked uh, in 2016 and 17 with our organisation as well to um, you know, pursuing a new and expanded national response program. Um, and uh, we were successful at that time at making the case for it. Um, but uh, since then, obviously, uh, you know, that response uh, hasn't successfully eradicated the fire ants. I think we've seen a really successful containment that's kept them, you know, penned into this part of Southeast Queensland. But, uh, you know, it's clear that uh, we need to really up the ante on these ants if we're going to successfully eradicate them. What specifically worries you about their environmental impacts? Yeah, so for me, when you look at um, the impacts of fire ants, there are just so many different species where we will see population loss or, you know, abundance loss. Um, one example that I would give to you is the uh, Wallum sedge frog, which is a vulnerable frog species. Mm -hmm. Its um, habitat is largely, you know, southeast Queensland, northern New South Wales, and it maps, its ideal habitat maps perfectly onto the kind of habitat that fire ants thrive in, in their native range in South America. You know, flooded seasonal wetlands, um, open without canopy. Mm -hmm. And there's about, you know, probably as low as 10,000 uh, individual wallum sedge frogs left. And fire ants recently are, were detected on the Sunshine Coast, you know, just a few hundred metres from a conservation area that had been put aside for the wallum sedge frog. So, you know, this really brings it home to me about why it is so important that we get on top of this problem. I might stay on the environmental impacts just for a little bit longer, but let's look back at the, the US. Um, you, you've, talk, you've talked about some of the, uh, you know, the human impacts in, in Texas and mm -hmm. all of the southern states. What is it doing to the environment, mm -hmm. natural environment in, in your state? Yeah, so there are loads. I mean, you could get out in the literature and find loads of papers that describe reduction and abundance of different invertebrate species. But we also have some sort of keystone species that are of great concern in our state. So uh, first and foremost, I, I've, I've shared this story with lots of folks as I've traveled through Australia. We have a um, oh, <clears throat> we have a tendency to name and celebrate um, insects, plants, and animals that are endemic to our part of the world and make them our state plant or state tree. And our our, our state lizard, we have one of those actually, <laughs> our state lizard in Texas <laughs> is the Texas horn lizard. And when I grew up, these, these lizards were everywhere. They're really cute, uh, very round, sort of um, uh, robust lizards. They've got little horns. They can shoot blood out of the corners of their eyes and defend. Yeah, it's it's they're remarkable. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So, yeah. So and anyway, they can take on the fire ant. Well, um, it's interesting. So these, like I say, these were everywhere in Central Texas when we grew up. Every everybody had them as pets. You'd keep them for the summer and turn them back out. And um, most of their diet is made up of a, another ant species called the harvester ant. We have several species of these throughout Central Texas where the fire ants occur, oh, well, across all the range in Texas. We don't find those any longer. They have lost their competitive battle for um, for habitat with red and forked fire ants. And so also following their demise is our state lizard, the Texas horn lizard. Mm -hmm. um, and you can find them still in areas of the state, the northern portions of the state where we don't have fire ants. But yeah, so this is a uh, sort of an indirect impact on a vertebrate species as a result of fire ants competing with an invertebrate species that's losing their war with fire ants. So this is the cascading impact. Correct. Uh, what makes the fire ants so good at annihilating insects yeah. and why uh, do they do this in their native environment? Mm. Talk about their native environment and what and the difference in the... Yeah, yeah, that would set the stage for answering your first question, mm -hmm. actually. So um, Australians are familiar with uh, invasive ants such as um, Argentine ants, and I believe you guys have rover ants. Um, let's see, in our in our state, we have tawny crazy ants, fire ants. All of these species, their native system is in Central and South America, mm. right? And so you've got overlapping populations of very competitive ants, but they and 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 as a result of that, they regulate their populations. So if you if you want to go find fire ants in their native system, you know it could be a hike. To find a colony or two, They're rare, right? Mm -hmm. But when they get out of that competitive environment, competitive environment, and 
you know, find their way first to the U.S. and now several other countries, they're no longer faced with those really difficult competitive interactions. They they outcompete our, you know, if you think about the the resource budget that's available to all ants and invertebrates in the system, it's finite, and the fire ants tend to take the lion's share of that. So it's not as though they're out warring with other ants. There will be some some aggression, of course, when they come in contact with one another. Uh, but usually it's just more territorial. You know, they're just establishing their territory. But as far as the resource budget is concerned, they're able to command the lion's share of that to the exclusion of other insect species. Because there's no sort of competitors to fight back to have natural diseases. That's right. And, that's right. And so it's a bit of a free range for them. And um... that's right. And that's that's their story. So, you know, we may have a hundred and up to 120 cents, up quite cases more than this, 140 individual colonies per acre. Do you imagine that looking across a warty habitat full of mm -hmm. big mature fire ant colonies? That's not that's not even that well, you know, that's not even counting the uh immature colonies that mm -hmm. are inconspicuous in the environment as their colonies are growing under the soil. Um, and each one of those colonies may have several hundred thousand worker ants that yeah. have to be supportive. Right. And multiple queens? Multiple queens. Yeah. So there's a lot of mouths to feed. There's only so many resources to go around, and fire ants do a very, very good job of of uh, obtaining their share. Uh, uh, just staying, just finally, Robert, on the, the, the environmental impacts, you talked about the impacts on the birds, the native birds as well. Oh, yeah. Tell us about Horn, Texas Wizard. Yeah, yeah. Well, not only birds, but well, so essentially any ground nesting birds are at peril <clears throat> from red imported fire ants. Now, some birds, they have eggshells that are thin enough that can be pipped by the fire ants. So like our Bob White quail. But then we have we have wild turkey populations too in Texas. Their eggshells are very thick. Mm -hmm. They're not getting through those eggs. But when the the hatchlings are on the ground, mm -hmm. they're in some degree yeah. of peril. Mm -hmm. And then you've got um, other reptiles. So our turtles that lay these leathery eggs underground. They, they, you know, they, these ants can go right through those if they want. Yeah. Um, and this makes me concerned about some of your endemic species in Australia. Yeah, particularly yeah. some of our um, egg laying mammals. Right. That we that's have. right. Yeah, that's right. And what yeah. happens if you're a rancher? Uh, you Grazing cattle, mm -hmm. horses, mm -hmm. sheep. Uh, yeah. Are you concerned about fire ants? Well, you, you are, especially during your, so if you have a cow calf operation, which is very common in our state for landowners to um, <clears throat> have breeding populations of cows, well, they will um, go to great lengths to remove fire ants from those systems where those, those paddocks and pastures where they're, where the calving operations are going on, because if, you know, if a mama cow drops a baby in the near vicinity of a fire ant colony, it can be fatal. All right, there's a few questions coming through on the Q&A. Don't forget, use the Q&A button and post your questions. So thanks for the questions that come through. Um, there's a question that is there, which I'm, I might um, draw on a, you know, ask a broader question to Rachel. We've got a question coming from Dick, Dick Clark. Is Australia's current response adequate? Rachel, what is Australia's current response? Thank you, and thanks for the question um, to Dick. So we are going into or in the second year of a four-year response plan that was approved uh, by all agricultural ministers across Australia last year. Um, now, the, the the bill on that one is circa $593 million of million, investment. Million dollars. Billion, yes. yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, not billion, but yes, let's mm -hmm. not bankrupt the country. Um, $593 million over the next four years. Now, what that uh, response, the, the genesis of that new response plan was a strategic review in 2021. Now, there has been a number of reviews of the National Fire Ant Program in its lifespan, which, as you mentioned earlier, is, is around, well, we're now up to 23 years. Um, now, what the new response plan is doing is addressing about, there was 27 recommendations from that strategic review. Uh, and to put it simply, the new response is all about uh, a horseshoe around the infestation in southeast Queensland, the last remaining bastion to eradication. Uh, and the, the approach is that every year or two of the plan, we move the band in. So there is a band of surveillance um, outside of the known areas for fire ants. There is a large treatment band inside that. And then there's a suppression zone. So it's this sort of three, three stages of approach. Um, is it adequate? 
Dick, we are absolutely determined for it to be adequate. Um, you know, if we if we had that uh, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, would we would we take more money? Of course we would, but um, we are really confident in the program's ability after 23 years to have the knowledge and create the efficiencies um, to be able to eradicate them. I think the real measure of success is going to be that uh, the perimeter coming in and exactly. being able to declare yeah. as free exactly. rather of fire ants rather than keeping on announcing new outbreaks. Exactly. How do you do? How, what do you do if you find you mentioned the surveillance outside of the mm. uh, the perimeter area, mm. the biosecurity zone, the eradication ring? What do you do if there's a new outbreak uh, outside of that? I don't know. There's been um, outbreaks a couple in New South Wales to the mm. south and also to the north in Toowoomba and even north of Caboolture. Mm. So tell me what's the process there and how, how can you deal with that without distracting you too much from your current uh, sure, radiation sure. program? Um, I think just taking us back one step, in the, it's important to note that through the lifetime of this program, there has been outlier detections. Mm. This isn't a new thing for us. Um, and certainly we, while it is not, um, you know, every time we get one of these, you're right, Andrew, we have to divert divert small resources to managing it. Um, we certainly see it uh, as a good thing because we've got the engagement of the communities. They are looking for these. They are reporting them. And it's also important to note that um, the way we find these outlier detections <laughs> is through we often uh, get them from members of the public, which is amazing and great. Um, good to see them engaged. But we also, the, the program itself also um, has detected a number of them by the surveillance that's going on on the outside of that band. Yes. Um, so we get these um, outliers from a number of sources, which again feeds back to that collective effort we're going to need um, to eradicate. So once we are aware of them, uh, dependent on where they are. So New South Wales is a bit of a um, outlier outlier for us in that it mm. crossed a, a border, uh, which we know fire have zero respect for, which is really inconsiderate of them. So the response in New South Wales was a collective effort between the program and our colleagues at the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. Um, but so once it's detected, of course, the program deploys the resources to uh, to um, gather samples, uh, do the genetic tracing and start treatment straight away. Um, now, as you mentioned in your intro, we've already eradicated fire ants seven times in Australia. So when we get these outlier detections, it is a well-oiled machine. Uh, this team know what to do and they know how to do it, which is why um, I, I appreciate it can be... Um, it can be fatiguing and disheartening for people um, with the Southeast Queensland infestation, but remembering just how much of a jump they had on us at that time, just how much we've learned um, doesn't make eradicating fire ants impossible from Australia. Um, I spent a little bit of time on Minjiraba, North Stradbroke, and was you know just there just after they detected fire mm -hmm. ants in this really sort of world heritage quality uh, island okay. uh, site. Um, managed by the Kwandamooka people. Mm. And I think this reminds us, I think, you know, the role of the community here because uh, luckily they found the, yeah. the uh, infestation. The sooner we find it, the better. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's a really important thing because it didn't get there by itself, did it? it the didn't. fire ants did not, the queens didn't, weren't blown there and fly, they fly there, it didn't assume it assisted. Yes, yeah, so that, that's the joy of having, again, the 23 years of data. Whenever we're getting um, detections, particularly these outliers, um, they, they are looking at the genetics. Now, we're not proving exactly which spot it came from, but um, we've got enough material there to understand the genetic lineage and to try and, and to do the trace back to, to look at where roughly where it came from. Um, Minjerabar is... is um, it's such a, a unique one for us in a multitude of ways. You've already mentioned it, that it's a the biodiversity and the ecological and environmental significance of Minjerabar is off the charts. There's also significant cultural um, significance to that. And, and you mentioned the Kwandamooka people who have been amazing um, in working with us. Um, but 
it, it is human assisted human assisted movement um, is by and large probably the biggest risk mm. for this program, yes. which is why the new response plan has got that significantly what fourfold up weighting in both uh, people um, resources and funding to ensure that we are educating and working with the industries who carry fire ants and of course the millions of people in the community to make sure that no one is inadvertently um, bring us, bringing us unstuck. Thanks, Rachel. Now this is uh, Aliens Among Us Q&A webinar. Uh, we're calling live from Griffith University with our with special guests, Robert Pucker from Texas A&M University, Rachel Che from mm -hmm. Biosecurity Queensland and Rhys Pienta from the Invasive Species Council. And don't forget to keep posting your questions in the Q&A um, part of the Zoom. We're getting a few coming through, so thank you for that. Um, I think we need to talk about what's happening inside the horseshoe, inside the, air, the, the ring of eradication. Mm -hmm. And while the residents in this vast area, we're talking hundreds of thousands of hectares, aren't we? Yes. And probably over a million people. It might be a few years before the eradication comes in mm -hmm. to their area. So meanwhile, there are fire ants there, mm -hmm. the numbers are growing. And the Queensland government is funding itself a fire ant suppression task force just to at least respond to requests. We need help with treating the ants because I think the you know, the aim is not for the numbers to build up. Do you want to talk about that FAST program and yep. what what's what the aim of that is? Sure. Um, so the FAST program, um, which saves me. Um, saying lots of words. Um, <laughs> what to your point, uh, Andrew was a government, a Queensland government funded initiative. Yep. And just to make the distinction, I think we've already mentioned, but just to be abundantly clear, the eradication program is a nationally funded program, um, which is operating within the national biosecurity system, which sees yeah. um, all state and territory and the Commonwealth government coming together where they recognise that a pest is of national interest. And that's also, I realise it might seem like a play on words, but it's also another important statement to make that this isn't a Queensland problem. Mm. Red important fire ants are a national issue which is why we have those cost share partners. So I'll get off my soapbox about that. Um, so the FAST program, as you said, was stood up by the Queensland government. It was part of the 2021 strategic review, which suggested that Queensland, so the Southeast Queensland infestation, had to focus um, on suppression while awaiting eradication. So the point of that task force is to work with uh, all levels of government, landholders and communities to assist in keeping numbers down um, while they await that band to come inwards towards them. Um, and it's a it is a combination of of yes, the you know, in cases, the provision um, of bait to assist people, um, but it's largely about education um, under that sort of compliance framework. Because again, we recognise that people are not doing the wrong thing maliciously, uh, and they just need help um, to understand what they can do to help us in some of the numbers. So their responsibility is uh, to make sure if they're moving high risk materials outside of the zone, mm. there's all sorts of controls around that. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. There is already there are well established and long established biosecurity control zones uh, to do with fire ants, which for commercial entities is very important. You know, uh, soil, uh, hay, turf. Uh, as you mentioned, um, Dr. Puckett, these are tricky little suckers, uh, yeah. and they really, yeah. um, they are really quite inventive in how they uh, can be moved around. Um, so yes, it's incredibly important that those products are either not moved outside of the zone, or if they are, they follow strict measures to ensure they're not transporting them. Mm. Now, for those of you who might worry that we're just um, giving the government an opportunity just to, to, to say what you know about the program, and we're not going to at least talk about it from the invasive species council um, point of view, we are non-government. Uh, and we aren't entirely happy with where we are now. We know there's a lot more need to be done. We want the fire ants eradicated. And there's a good program in place, but it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. Now, I think one of the areas we're concerned about is the, the build-up of fire ants inside this suppression area. Um, Reese and Robert, you were recently at Cedar Grove with mm -hmm. some communities that were seeing large densities of fire ants on their property inside the suppression yeah. zone. Robert, what does it make you think seeing seeing what you saw? What do you want to describe what you saw? Hmm. Well, 
unfortunately, it sort of reminded me of home in terms of the number of mounds we saw. Um, but, you know, that that gave me a good opportunity to, Reese and I actually, a good opportunity to meet with uh, the land care folks out there and mm. talk about the, the mature colonies versus mm. young colonies. So this is this is an area that I think, <clears throat> well, of course, over time, if, if these ants are allowed to expand and proliferate, everybody will get very familiar with their biology. And, and just like we have in the United States, I mean, this is one of the insects in the United States. There aren't that many people in the U.S. walking around with a deep knowledge of insect biology, mm -hmm. but folks really are educated on fire ant biology. Yeah, We've been dealing with them for decades. Um, and, and your folks are coming up to speed. And But one of the issues that, that I'm seeing as I travel around the country and even meeting with the pest managers down in Gold Coast is that there's this natural um, sort of focus on the large mounds in the habitat. So we met with a large acreage landowner and he was very proud to show us how he was treating his his mounds, his his mature colonies with a contact insecticide. And I had to explain to him, well, that that's awesome and very satisfying. But the reality is all of those large mature colonies started as a, as a queen that landed in the environment and for many months, you know, she may have had a few thousand workers in the colony, but their nest architecture was not complex enough to require them to deposit earth on top of the soil. So you couldn't see anything. Couldn't see the them. Ground. You couldn't see them. And so we set up a sort of a field day and Reese and I put out some food lures in areas where there were no apparent mounds. And this was a gamble because I didn't know what was <laughs> going to show up, but I predicted what would. And and sure enough, we we spent, what, 45 minutes or so did. talking yeah. Yeah. and went back out and took the group and said, well, let's take a look at these these food lures and what was, and your, yes. what, what, what was your lure? Yeah, so as close as could be found, American style hot dogs, because that's what we use in our survey <laughs> work. Kind of thing, yeah. Uh, yeah, and some potato chips. Yeah. This is what we use, just simple things that most folks have laying around yeah. in the <laughs> kitchen. And uh, what do we have? Seven of eight were we had yep. fire ants on them. Yeah. And so this, it, it was really kind of an aha moment, I think, mm -hmm. for those that saw this. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, what about those guys? Because mm -hmm. if you're only focusing on treating your individual uh, conspicuous mounds, but you're kind of spinning your wheels if you're in, in an area that has a high density of fire ants. And this is why the program uses broadcast data. This is why we yeah. do that too at home. Yeah. 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 So the the foragers from the end, well, Reese said the program uses broadcast baiting. That's what we would do at home because we know that the foragers, even in those young colonies, have to go out and forage for food and they find the baits just like the big mature colonies. They bring them back and die. So you use broadcast <laughs> bait even in an area like the suppression zone where you're just trying to keep fire ants out of your life but what would you do in the eradication zone would you be would you of course would you use um, well or, that might be worth talking about uh, mm -hmm. are you trying to eradicate fire ants anywhere in the united uh, states yeah this is a good so i've had to shift gears a number of times yeah. in these public discussions it's yeah it's a different thing right right so from the time i was a child well, our country abandoned its hopes of eradicating decades and decades ago, back in the 50s and 60s. We put up a good fight, but we we approached it incorrectly. Uh, we used contact insecticides. And this, of course, it, it killed a lot of fire ant colonies, not all of them, but it also killed other invertebrate, well, ants in particular, yeah. our native ants, indiscriminately. So that then in the, the, um, the next few swarming seasons, of course, fire ants were swarming into areas that didn't have natural competitors. And that's when we lost. But we've since learned the value of, of using insecticidal baits, formula, insectis, using insecticides, but formulated as baits. Um, this is really the way to go at this. And so, yeah, so we we train folks that- It's the value know, of baits, right? Is that you're, in yeah. our context, where we're trying to eradicate right. them, you're getting the mounds you can see and, and the ones that, like yeah. at Cedar Grove, you'd be getting the, the, the colonies below ground, the incipient ones that you can't right. see. That's right. That's right. And as part of an eradication program, that is critical, right? You can't, you know, you would never be able to eradicate this population of ants mm -hmm. by treating individual yeah. colonies. Yeah. Because you would have the young ones coming right behind you. Yeah. And then they would be off to the races. And so, yeah, you, I, I think the program is sound. Um, it's just, do, do you have the will to continue on and put the work into it? That's mm -hmm. the big, the big story. I mean, I think, I think that the plan is sound and I think, I think there's a, like this this really is the first time, sorry, Andrew, but this really is the first time where there's been that comprehensive boundary around the outside, mm. um, you know, really to try and contain and actually contract the population. Right. But I think the bit that we're probably a little bit alarmed about is is the 
increasing densities in that suppression zone and the risk mm -hmm. of those ants well it increases the risk rather than getting into a carrying material and moving oh, to another yeah. part of the country yeah i think it's reasonable to conclude that the greater the density of ants in the containment zone the greater the probability that is that somehow they slip out mm -hmm. um, through human assisted means yeah so yeah. i've got to ask a question from arthur uh it's sort of is there enough funding for uh well the fire ant program and you also asked about other invasives, but maybe you focus on the fire ant program. Reese, maybe you're the best one to answer this. Uh, well, we have been pretty vocal about the fact that we don't want fire ants to be underestimated. And we're an independent advocacy organization. So we, of course, want to see more resources as you know, an adequate level of resourcing put into fire ant eradication. We have a very high degree of confidence in the plan. Um, but in in the past, I would argue that perhaps we have underestimated fire ants and, you know, we haven't drawn that delimitation line far enough out. Mm. You know, we haven't approached it um, being mindful of the human element in moving fire ants because like most invasive species, the human element is really, you know, a, a key Achilles heel when you're trying to deal with, mm. with something with an invasive species. Um, at the moment, the funding is guaranteed until 2027 at the current level. Um, but we know from the 2021 review and, you know, even even just logically, we're not going to deal with this problem entirely in that time frame. So the current level of funding is is enough, really, I would say, to, to prove the concept. But we do need more funding on an ongoing basis for the fire and eradication <laughs> program. And in the short term for the suppression and containment and public engagement and awareness efforts as well. Um, and that's something we've been talking to the program about, to decision makers about, to journalists about, to anyone who listen, we're talking to them about mm -hmm. this because um, this really, this is the, the, the last chance. If, yeah. if we can't get it done this time and they break containment and then get out, the conversation changes entirely. It becomes about how do we manage the costs, the billions of dollars of costs every year that will be required on our country of living with these things. I might come to the cost in a minute, but there's a question from Dane, because uh, it'd be good to understand specifically how to treat the fire ants. Mm. Uh, so the question from Dane is, what is the current best method for treating fire ants in the United States? Robert? Yeah, well, we, we make heavy use of insecticidal baits. And but remember, we're not in an eradication effort. You know, we're we're just and there's no federal or state support for managing fire ants on your property, whether it's your yard or if you're a large acreage um, landowner. It's all up to the individual uh, how they want to go at this. So, you know, our research at the university over the past 20 years has been sort of around, you know, how, how do we maximize our efficiency in a, in a treatment program? Um, and baits really fit that bill quite nicely. Uh, most baits are fairly inexpensive um, compared to contact insecticides. They don't kill indiscriminately, um, and they're fairly easy to put out. Um, you can calibrate a hand spreader if it's your yard or a push spreader if it's a little bit larger area. Uh, we even have hoppers that are sold in the U.S. that you can fit onto like a UTV, a utility vehicle, mm -hmm. and uh, treat <clears throat> large areas of land, large pastures. So we're, we're good at doing this, um, and we've gotten that way through research and hard work over the years. But I think it's important to mention that we we use um, most of us use baits that are a little bit higher in toxicity than some of the insect growth regulators that the eradication program is using. Those will work for sure. Um, but I think, you know, in, in our situation, we're not trying to uh, work through a long term eradication program. Folks want these ants removed from the yard yesterday, you know. So you were telling me about what it's like to walk, walk into one of your or our hardware stores or our stock and station agents mm -hmm. and you know you're looking yeah. for a an insecticide but you're I think if I can you, show you a picture yeah show me um we'll hopefully share it we can share it online later on um people I thought in America would be quite wary of using chemicals um is this some is this the fact <laughs> of life in the US some people treat some people well, you're not in eradication program right so people are using less chemicals yeah, so <laughs> I think that's a lot. Okay, so let me set the record straight on American use of insecticides. I think most folks are are very wary about using insecticides around their homes, right? Their near home environment, schoolyards, etc. Those are general insecticides. Fire ants are different. We most people keep fire ant baits to treat their yards, um, 
And as you might imagine, you know, we've got this large area of the United States that is, is infested with fire ants, not nearly as large an area as what it will occur in your nation if they if they begin to spread and spread to all the areas of your country that, that, that will support them. Well, of course, there's market there for lots of insecticidal products. And I, I don't know, I don't know if I can get close to the screen there and and show those who have tuned in. Uh, let's give it a this go. is the picture that my wife took at our version of Bunnings, uh, Lowe's. Uh, yeah, that's right. it. That's it. That's yeah. Okay, yeah. So hopefully you guys can see the, the um, vast diversity of fire ant products that are available on the shelves in the United States. And these are purchased by homeowners, people who are not trained pest managers. Um, what I just showed you, uh, a small portion of those products that you saw were insecticidal baits, which is what we would like to see folks use. We think of those as sort of the least risk um, insecticide application for fire ants. What you saw in the picture, maybe you can take a, a screenshot or something and, and look in close, there are insecticidal dust formulations, liquid insecticides, and we're selling these to folks who have no real training. Not we. I don't sell product. We, the, but but on the market in the U.S. are, the US. are products that um, folks aren't really trained to use, but they can use, they can do it. Um, and so I think the message here is that you know for folks that are concerning themselves with the amount of insecticides that are using that are being used in an eradication effort over the short run, I think that's going to pale in comparison. Um, to what your markets for insecticides will look like if these break free and spread. So if this eradication program fails, mm -hmm. landowners are going to be putting a vast quantity of insecticides in the environment in perpetuity and possibly even more toxic than the ones that are being used by the eradication. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a safe that would be a safe bet to make. Well, that's probably a good mm -hmm. yeah, good reason to why we need to get this eradication program uh, successful. Well, I think it's it's important too to understand that the, the amount of money that we spend on these a year in the US. What's the so we're closing in on $9 billion a year, for the whole every US? single year, no, just for the Southern US. US. Billion US. Sorry. Correct, nine, billion almost $9 billion right. United States dollars. That's the yeah. impact and the control costs. Yeah, control costs, uh, medical expenses, um, replacement of electrical and mechanical uh, components that get destroyed around homes. You name it, they're a very, very costly insect. Reese, what are the figures that they've done around the impacts of fire ants on people? And because uh, they cause yes. anaphylactic shock for amongst some people, yeah? They can do. We um, were talking to some researchers last year out of uh, the University of Melbourne around this. And uh, because a lot of our data on this goes back to the very early days of the relocation mm. program, it is modeled on the population at that time. And uh, they've had a look at international comparisons and they sort of updated that data to say if fire ants, do break containment spread across the whole country, we'd be looking at about 650,000 extra hospital and, and doctor's visits every year. Mm. And uh, one of the really concerning things is, um, you know, it seems like fire ants do generate an anaphylactic reaction in much more commonly, much more prevalently than the stinging insects we're used to in Australia mm. with that mm. alkaloid venom that they have. Mm. So, um, you know, we're talking about things like availability of EpiPens for people that have those reactions, people developing sensitivities mm. through repeat exposure. So it becomes a considerable workplace health and safety issue for people in outdoor workforces. Mm. You know, most of the people I know who've been stung work in those kind of agricultural yeah. pest control construction sort of industries. So, um, you know, the the health costs from this are very significant, um, you know, yeah. not to mention the, the costs of management, costs to our environment, costs mm, to yeah. agricultural output. Right. Well, we've only got about 15 minutes left, probably even less. And I might just, uh, so that, you know, we're, thanks for all your questions where um, you might see me looking up to my left. That's because we've got the questions written up on a whiteboard here and I'm trying to go through as many as we can. I might just give Rachel a chance to talk a bit about the uh, health cost too. What, what's the, what's the, the government collectively thinking about this? Yeah, so you're entirely right, Reese, in that in a certain, and it is small, but nonetheless, yes. it's not insignificant pop, um, part of the population, they will suffer from anaphylaxis. Um, but there is plenty of in between. We know that our, um, our fire ant teams are often out at community 
functions up and on up and bunning sausages along the weekend and the amount of times they've been approached by by parents with young children in a stroller and covered with hundreds of bites mm. um, um so while anaphylaxis is an extreme example the in-between is is just as bad yes. um because um that, you know, again, they they swarm, you know, you don't, it's not like the green ant stings that I'm used to from childhood where you get one and, you know, you run screaming to the hills. Um, people who are stung by fire, fire ants will report that by the time they know they're there, they've got hundreds of them. And just imagining that on someone this tall, um, it, it the, the health costs are significant. Um, so it's it's not just about that that level of anaphylaxis. It's the all in between um, that um, um, can impact. And and of course, as per usual, and unfortunately, it's the vulnerable members of our community that are likely to be overrepresented in hospital visits, be it the um, um, young children or or the elderly. Yeah. Like this last question, Robert. Um, mm. How real is this in the lives of the people in Texas, this uh, fear of being stung and what it means for the people? Oh, it's, it's real. Um, once you determine that you're not allergic to their sting, then it's just a, a painful experience. And this happens to most folks, you know, many times over the course of a year. You know, golfers will tell you stories of stepping on colonies out in, on golf courses, you know, students at school and all this. One thing I, I have shared with folks, I'm a parent, and um, I think parents in the southeastern United States would echo this sentiment. We we can all tell you the story of the first time our children mm. sort of tumbled into a fire ant colony. And just as you said, it's very different when you know, talk mm. about a person that's this big, right? Yeah. That's a very nervous few moments for a parent. Obviously, you're dealing with the agonizing uh, screams of your children. But then after you settle that, you remember, oh, yeah, I don't know if they're allergic, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you spend some nervous moments wondering if, if that's the case and watching them, you know, for allergies to develop. Um, it, this is not a fun experience at all. Yeah, it's a deadly experience. Can be. Yeah, can be. I have a question from Anonymous. Uh, just come back to the safety of the bait. So I think we just need to reassure people. Well, I'm not here to reassure people, actually. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I probably been talking to Robert too much in the last couple of weeks yeah because I feel a lot more comfortable with the use of the baits given uh, I understand how we work but the question is can you discuss the safety of the baits I guess for people and maybe people's pets sure sure yeah so it's it's really important for folks to understand that the baits that are being used in the eradication program are um they're insect growth regulators so there's these are insect juvenile hormone mimics humans don't have juvenile hormones, right? So we don't we don't have the same the same hormones in our body. So those products have no impact on us or vertebrate animals. Um, now, as I mentioned before, we often employ more toxic baits in the US, so baits that have a nerve toxin. So you have to be a bit more cautious with those, but you know, we're we've have a very, very good safety rating with these products. I mean, we are we are very comfortable recommending to anyone that calls up on the phone at the lab and they say, hey, listen, I want to kill my fire ants. And first question is, are you okay using synthetic insecticides? And mm -hmm. if so, then here's some products. And that's what I typically recommend because folks want them gone soon, quick, you know. What about for the people's pets? Yes. Let's say their dogs and their cats. Yes, yes. If you look at the, the SDS sheets for these products, the mammalian toxicity is very, very low. So if we're talking about an, in an application event, you know, the, the number of granules on the ground is very small, just, you know, a dozen or so mm -hmm. in an area. Of, you know, this is a right angle, maybe a square meter. Yeah. I'm trying to show you. Yeah, right. a square if, meter. And what if your dog or cat eats them? Yeah, so you you don't want your dog or cat to eat them. Do you mean eat them out of the bag? No, mm -hmm. if they're on the grass. Off the ground. Yeah. Okay, yeah, you don't want them to ex be exposed to, to packaged products. Just right? like any sort of chemical. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. But in an application, it would, it, I can't imagine, first of all, I don't imagine a dog or a cat would be interested in those tiny granules at such a low application rate. It's not as though they go licking around on the ground for them. If they're fire ants, they're probably going to get a mouthful of fire ants doing right. that too. So no, we don't lose, we don't lose vertebrate, but we don't, you lose companion animals as a result of the application of baits. It's not a known animals. impact. No, I mean, if if we do, it's probably, you know, like we were discussing, accidental exposure to products that are not stored safely. I mean, these yeah. are insecticides. These are toxins, after all. But And certainly um, the rates at which the program uses these, and they're, they're well, well known and well described chemicals. They're not sort of a, a creation cooked up in the lab. They've been used for a long time oh, across yeah. a multitude of uses. Yes. And an average property... Um, it, the amount of active ingredient, which is the important part. So you've got this amount of bait, 
you've got this amount of active spread amongst it. Not everything you see That's right. um, is in a 100% um, active ingredient. Um, it's a chemical used commonly in dog flea and tick collars. So it's applied in great, significantly greater concentrations directly to people's pets mm -hmm. to protect them. Because mm -hmm. the bait itself, right, the mm -hmm. actin is the bit that makes it a fire ant bait. Mm -hmm. and the actual active ingredient is something that's used in a, a lot of other Absolutely. applications. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not a new Exactly. It's not a new I mean, So Rachel, I understand yeah. <laughs> in, the, in the suppression zone, uh, pretty soon there's going to be more availability if people want to treat their own yards and areas. Um, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. So the Fire and Suppression Task Force has already run a number of community initiatives um, whereby uh, households can sign up to receive free bait to use in their backyard. Um, now, they can do that via, um, there, there will be links on the Fire Ant website, which is also another excellent source for people who really want to immerse themselves in the world of fire ants. Um, and what will happen in those is the, the um, person will be posted some bait, um, but then we will follow up. So they will receive more bait at regular intervals to help them. Um, suppress. And so we're also working with local government who, um, of course, have a response, a, a general biosecurity obligation um, across the board uh, and also pertaining to fire ants. So we're working with them to assist them with the capability and the capacity to be able to manage because obviously local governments are often um, one of the bigger landholders in their areas. Great. Well, now for those people on the webinar who are not in South East Queensland in the fire ants, so, and there's a question from Amy. Is it possible there are unknown populations in regional areas in Australia? If you're outside the zone, um, you know, is that possible? Where, where can find possible. It? One thing I've learned in, in biosecurity is anything's possible. Mm -hmm. But as far as we are aware, um, obviously a lot of work went into, in southeast Queensland, de developing the response plan, which has got that band on the outside of what we're calling surveillance area. So where they took the, the outermost detection they knew and they lobbed on top of that a number of kilometres to try and make sure that we captured. So it, it is not impossible, but again, we've done this, we've been here, done this seven times before. Because those other seven outbreaks were from imports from separate, the southern U.S. Separate importation. But I understand there's a couple of uh, distant uh, detections from the southeast Queensland mm -hmm. outbreak in Melbourne yes. and Tasmania. So we know they can get a, a ride on uh, on, on transport. Yeah. So I think everyone in Australia needs to be on the lookout. What do we look for? What, what do fire ants look like, Robert? Well, if, if you're... If you're scanning the habitat and you see a large dome-shaped earthen mound, this may be something to concern yourself with. Although, you know, we've got the, mm -hmm. the termite colonies that we saw the other day that could be confusing. They're much smaller than that, mm -hmm. I think, those. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but those started small, for too, at one time. Yeah, yeah, looking for a mound. Other than that, I can't imagine people would be surveying with food lures, but they might. See, and so you wouldn't see the workers probably. You might just blend in on the habitat mm -hmm. like any other ant. I guess the sting is pretty... Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So they will... Uh, they they'll be happy to identify themselves for you if you um, <laughs> if you bump into one of their colonies. Yeah, they mount the third. They often exhibit that real swarming mm. behavior. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, How big are they? Yeah, just a couple of millimeters. They're very tiny. I think very that, tiny. I think that's the disappointing part. Yeah. When we hear in fire ants, we kind of expect them to be bright red with mm. speed stripes. Or no, things. they're boring ants. For Australians, exactly. They're not very they're charismatic. Like, yeah, yeah, they're just exactly. tiny and coppery yeah. brown, right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 Now, you may see the swarmers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they look yeah. like termite swarmers uh, uh, fleeing the colony during the uh, time of year that they do swarm. Mm. They see yeah. those. Well, I'm, I'm sure the Biosecurity Queensland's got some good information on their mm. website, so it's maybe that's lot. where you go for the yeah, information. Mm. We're going to start to wind up now, but I might just ask Robert one question before yeah. I maybe ask a broader question. Um, so, Robert, what have we learned um, mm. from your experience of fire ants in the US that we can take to Australia? What's the message in Australia yeah. here? Yeah, two, a few things. Um, the, these ants will not stop spreading in your country without human inter intervention. Mm -hmm. They will not They will not stop this march across your habitat. Um, and people will take them with them as they move around the country as well. So human-assisted movement. Our university and many others in the Southern United States have spent decades honing our ability to kill these colonies, right? And so you have all of that literature available to you. You got a great plan in place. 
These products will kill your fire ants, the products that you're using. Um, I think it's just, I think you guys, th those of you that are maybe on the other side of the country, on the Western side, they'll get there Ooh, if they can. Yeah. Uh, if, if, if they're so, not managed on this side. You're not safe in Perth with the big uh, desert in the way. Uh, no, you're not safe in Tasmania no, with the they'll, they'll water. Get no, they'll, they'll move together. around your country. Yeah, you are all in this together. I think in 2017, um, we met with folks over on, we the, did. on the Western yep. side and didn't fire ants arrive there at one they, point. They did in 2019. Yeah, so yeah. so yeah, it's just they're going to continue to spread. You ha you have to make this push. Even if even if it were to fail, at least you would have tried, you know, but let's hope it won't. Let's hope you, you guys um, knock these out. If I went to a Texan in the street and asked them what they thought we should do with fire ants, they would tell you that you're wasting your time talking to them. Get to work. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. All right. I, I want to make sure we think about what's ahead of us. Uh, and do we, it's a pretty formidable foe, these fire ants. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we just heard are the massive impacts. Mm -hmm. It's easy not to be optimistic. I want to maybe just go through each of you mm -hmm. and talk about what is your level of optimism about I know that the uh, the government's saying we're going to have a uh, fire ant free Olympics in Brisbane in 2032. Mm. Rachel, are you optimistic we can eradicate the fire ants from Australia? Yes, it's a pretty simple answer. You know, we know what to do. Um, we know how to eradicate them. We've proven this to ourselves time and time again. We what we need is, as we've been talking about, we need appropriate partnership with all state and territory um, and Commonwealth governments. But we also need community partnership as well. Now I realise at the moment it's a crowded space. Everyone has got mm. big concerns um, outside of biosecurity. But if we um, if we bunker down, we believe in the science, which again, as Dr. Puckett has said. The science is sound. We just need everybody to help us. Reese, are you optimistic? You know what? I'm actually more optimistic now than I have been for a very long time on this issue. And, you know, I've had people describe it to me as in the past as, oh, this is a bit of a moonshot, right? And I've been thinking about that. We actually made it to the moon mm -hmm. and we use science to get there and hard work. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what we need here. We need the right science and hard work. And I think we've got mm -hmm. that. But, you know, when I go down, uh, and I didn't get to say this before about Cedar Grove, the really remarkable thing there was when we were back down there on Saturday and to see that community roll mm -hmm. out on a Sunday afternoon mm -hmm. yeah. uh, because they are hungry for information on how they can help support this eradication mm -hmm. effort. Mm -hmm. The same with the, the cane growers down in, in the, in the Rocky Point cane yeah. growing district. Amazing. And, you know, th these are people who they've had a bit of a journey. They've gone from skepticism to enthusiasm. Mm. And I think that's the kind of community support and mobilization we're going to need to support this program. But I can see it happening. So that's mm -hmm. it really encouraging. And that's what it's going to take. I'm, I'm very hopeful you can do this. I, this, as you say, science is sound. We, we we understand their biology mm. perfectly. We understand um, how to get insecticides to them. Um, and that's what you guys are doing. So I think as long as you work the plan and mm. then your citizenry within the range of fire ants, they have to buy in. Yep. They, they, and I don't, I just mean they have to be surveilling for ants. They have to be careful not to carry them outside of the zone. They need to stay put while you guys work to destroy them. And share that. tools and yeah, that's how to get right. it done. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, we've got an almighty goal ahead of us. I'm so pleased that we're all optimistic. Um, I'm so grateful to have Robert here mm. spending two and mm. a half weeks in Australia. Uh, he's given generously his time and his expertise. I've learned a lot, but I know that the fire and eradication team has learned a lot. And he's engaged with the public to really understand their concerns mm their fears, but also the promise of a fire ant free Australia. Mm. So you've given us a gift and thank you for your time away from family mm. and um, your time helping us in Australia to eradicate fire ants. Well, oh, it's my thank pleasure. You, it's my pleasure. Thank you. So Dr. Robert Puckett from Texas A&M University and on the panel joining us today is Dr. Rachel Che from Biosecurity Queensland, who heads up the uh, government uh, fire ant eradication program on behalf of all of us in Australia. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rachel, and Reese Pienta, uh, Advocacy Manager for the Thank Invasive you. Species Council. So that's uh, that's our Alien Among Us Q&A webinar. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, we're going to put the recording of this on our website, and any questions that we didn't, didn't get to today, we'll hopefully put them up on the website too. Our next uh, Aliens Among Us is going to be in a few months' time. 
And thanks everybody for listening. Really appreciate uh, the panel here and the great discussion. See you later. Bye-bye.